My name is Vicki Van Sickle. I am a head counselor at Camp Penguin, which means I get to be involved in the really fun part, which is picking all the books and all the authors, and you are in for a treat today. So I just want to remind everyone of a few rules. So number one, please make sure your microphone is on mute. Number two, please make sure your video is off. And number three, we are going to be using the chat for questions only. So we're not going to use it for now. You can actually close that chat right now if you like. At the end of Kelly's presentation, I'll tell you to open it back up, and that's where you can put any questions questions you have for our author today. So we don't need to use the chat now. It's so nice to see everyone. We have people here from all over the US and Canada, which is amazing. We're so happy to have you here with us virtually at Camp Penguin. So you can leave that chat right now. And now I would like to introduce you to our guest author today. So today we are very lucky to have Kelly Armstrong with us. Kelly has written many books for many ages and many different genres. But today she's here to talk about her Camp Penguin book, A Royal Guide to Monster Slaying. So I'm going to ask Kelly to turn on her video she'll get started and say hi and then we're ready to go for Camp Penguin hi Kelly hello hey every, every everyone yes you can see that I'm here at home and hopefully this will all go uh, well I live out in the country so our internet is horrible but we're going to cross our cross our fingers that it uh, works so here I'm uh, gonna be talking about the uh, royal guide to a uh, to monster slaying series, specifically today about the monsters that I uh, created for it. Uh, you'll find in a lot of books, the you know, monsters are magical. We don't have to ask ourselves where they came from or how they got like that. It's just magic. And, and I've done a lot with magic in the past, but for this one, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do science-based to uh, instead be looking at these monsters and saying what if there was no magic in the world and all these monsters that we see around us actually come from science so today when you have a question like where does the wind come from you can just look it up or go and ask an expert in the past though, people couldn't just look up questions online and sometimes they couldn't even just go to uh, the library and get the answer. In fact, for a lot of things, there were no answers. Science was still being developed. And so we were still looking at how do these things happen? And when people are looking at that, so I'm just gonna to give you a sec here. I'm moving it so I can see my actual notes. <laughs> so when people can't answer questions, they often make up stories. Uh, maybe you've done that. When you were young, you may have made up a story to answer the question of where does, where does a rain come from? Or sometimes if we've done something we weren't supposed to, we make up stories to explain how that happened. People love making up stories. So when they came up with how to explain science, they did a lot of looking at ancient gods. So they would say something like, where does the wind come, come from? It must be a god, such as Fujin here, who is the uh, Japanese Shinto god of the, of the wind. We could also ask questions like, where does thunder and lightning come from? Maybe it's Thor, the Norse god of thunder and a lightning banging his his hammer next slide sorry i am forgetting the next next slide ones <laughs> sometimes stories are more compli compli complicated uh, if they're to ask something like why do the sun and the moon seem to revolve around uh, the earth Today, we know that the sun doesn't revolve around us, we revolve around it, but the answer for both is gravity. Next slide. At one time, though, people believed that the reason that the, earth, that the sun and moon went around the, uh, the earth was that they were being pursued by giant wolves. They believed that the sun and the moon were godlike deities and they were going around in these chariots being pulled by uh, horses. Uh, so we, we had Saul, who, which actually is the uh, word for son, and Mani, who is 
who what is the uh, Norse word for moon, and we can see them here in their in their chariots. Um, they believed that they were being constantly pursued by giant wolves, skull, and hattie. Um, and the idea be, behind this would also be that when we had an eclipse, so when you have an eclipse, the sun seems to go out or the moon seems to go out. And this explains that too, because what, the, what that meant is that the uh, wolves temporarily caught the sun or the uh, moon. So if you had a solar eclipse, it meant that skull temporarily got hold of soul and so the sun went went out but of course soul escaped and kept on going and that's why we saw the sun come back um, and they also believed that when when the world ended it would be that Saul and it would be that Saul and Manny were caught for good so if that ever happened the world would actually end Next slide. So we can see some bones here. A man, so we, we uh, know now that these bones belong to what's called a protoceratops, similar to a, a tri, tri, triceratops. But imagine if you lived in the ancient world and you dug up these bones on your farm um, and you had no idea what dinosaurs were. You couldn't go and ask anybody where these bones came from. Imagine too that you have a really good imagination and you're gonna try to figure out, well, what, what, what would the animal that had these bones maybe have, have looked like? Um, and you're going to probably use animals that you already know. So rather than completely make up something new, you're going to say, this animal could have been part this and part that. Next slide. So what you could get is something like a griffin. You're, it is made up of animals that the ancient world would, would, would have known or at least heard of. So you've got the top half of an eagle and the bottom half of a lion. Next slide. Okay. Sometimes people did the same for actual animals. If they saw something and they didn't know what it was, they made up stories and they came up with some pretty weird uh, ones. So these are some, some old drawings of what we would now call mermaids. Um, this is what people thought they saw when what they really saw was, next slide, these manatees. They're found in warmer waters and sailors who saw them might have never, never seen manatees before all they saw was this creature coming up out of the water and they can come straight up like this like a mermaid and somehow they imagined that these were mermaids now we look at them now and say how could you ever have made that mistake but they'd been on the ocean for a really long time they were looking at something very far away and we do like to see something magical. Um, it's a lot of fun to make things things up and obviously the mermaids are a little more interesting looking than than the man, man, manatees. Your imagination can make up things that are a lot more interesting than what you actually see. Next slide. So with the Royal Guide to Monster Slaying, I wanted to do the reverse. Instead of seeing a an regular animal and imagining something more monstrous, something more interesting, I wanted to take what we have in mythology and folklore and say, how could science explain that? What if it wasn't just magical, but it really was something based on science. These were regular creatures who were had either evolved into that or had evolved separate from that. Next slide. So I used a combination of uh, creatures from myth and 
folklore. Uh, this one here is from American folklore. It is called a jackalope, which is really just a jackrabbit with antlers. Um, the, what early settlers in the area did really was they came up with this animal as a joke. It was the kind of thing where if somebody was visiting, they would joke about, oh, have you seen a jackalope? Here's what it looks like. Um, or if somebody was new to the area, they would try to trick them by saying there were things called jackalopes. It's what we call a tall, tall tale where they're just trying to have some fun with the uh, with the new newcomers. If you've ever seen anything on drop bears, which are in the second book, uh, Griffin's, the, uh, sorry, the Griffin's Lair, drop bears are a current Australian tall tale where they tell stories about uh, koala bears that are deadly and drop out of trees and kill people. They, they don't exist, but if you look online, you'll see so-called pictures of them. So a jackalope was the same kind of, kind, of, kind of thing. Now, when I look at it, I say, okay, so we've got this jackrabbit with antlers. Why might a jackrabbit evolve it to have antlers? Uh, the obvious reason is for, defense. That's generally why any kind of animal has, uh, has uh, antlers. So most defense mechanisms are seen on prey an animals. But I thought, well, what if this could instead be a little more different and be a predatory jackrabbit? What if it is a carnivore? Then I can come up with the antlers are there for both fighting off other comp competition and for fighting off larger predators, but it needs more than just antlers. So that's where I start getting into things like semi-retractable semi claws. That means that the claws can, are always partly out, which really helps for running. Cheetahs have semi-retractable claws, but they, but they also can be extended as uh, weapons, which would be great for a predator predator. You get stripes, you, you can see stripes, uh, stripes on him, um, and that is for hiding to go after his uh, uh, prey. Um, and you're going to see them being bigger than, I've got them down as being twice, twice the size of regular rabbits. Again, that works better for a predator. It can go after smaller uh, prey. Next slide. Most monsters are either a blend of two animals or they're a familiar animal, one that we already know, but it has a different feature. So in A Royal Guide to uh, Monster Slaying, I think of each new feature as an adaptation, like why would the jackalope develop antlers? And I do that for all of them, say, well, okay, a man, let's say um, let's say a, a horse. What could a horse evolve that would help it survive? Uh, one thing, like I mentioned, predators or sorry, or sorry, prey animals often have antlers and horns to defend themselves. So what if we took a horse and gave it a horn to defend its itself? Next, next slide. Oops, right here. Or what if we gave uh, a uh, horse gills to swim underwater? Next slide. This water horse is from book two, the uh, Griffin's Lair. It's called the Kepeldoor from Welsh myth. Next slide. You could also give a horse wings to fly. Next slide. So here we see a Pegasus. Now, while it's a lot of fun to imagine these, uh, these things, sometimes they wouldn't actually be possible scientifically. You can actually go online and find people talking seriously about whether or not it's possible for a horse to have wings. I went and read lots of that because I wanted to see, was it possible? And how would I have to describe my Pegasus to get I, to get a, um, sorry, just a sec here, I've lost my screen. 
<laughs> to get something that could actually fly. So some of the adaptations would have to be that it would need, need to be small. So it would need to be smaller than your average horse. It would need to have lighter um, bones. So it has to be very sort of thin with the thinner uh, legs, thinner back, back, back legs. And could it still fly? I'm not completely sure. I'm not convinced that it's possible to make wings big enough for a horse to act, to actually fly, but I try to make it plausible so we can look at it and say, okay, maybe that couldn't actually happen, but at least I've tried to make it believable. Next slide. You can see an even bigger picture of um, the Keffel Dur, the uh, water horse here. So this is a scene from the Griffin's Lair that shows a bunch of different monsters. So what we have here, we see the Griffin. Remember, I showed you the uh, Griffin with the bones. Uh, this is my Griffin. This is a baby one flying up at the top uh, there. Uh, the actual danger, though, comes from the Keppel Dur. So you can see that big green water horse. You can see the the gills in its in its uh, neck, um, and you also see if you look over to the far left, you'll have Encanato, which are a type of dolphin monster from South American folklore. If you look closely, you see that middle middle figure there. That is Rowan holding her holding her sword, flying off of her shoulder is Jacko, who is our young Jack Jackalope. And you'll see two other uh, characters there. You will see, um, you will see Dane with his bow and Alianor holding her uh, dagger on the left hand side. So this is how I approach to monsters in this, in this series, is can I make them believable without magic? As much as I love magic, it's a lot of fun to do that reverse thing. And instead of saying, how can I explain this scientific thing with magic? How can I explain this magical thing with science? So what I would challenge you guys to do is to make up your own monster. Come up with different different animals, put them together and see. There are so many out there already in folklore, but there's also lots that we don't see. Um, there's also lots of ideas there. I have no shortage of monsters that I can use in this, in this uh, series, but it is still fun to make up your uh, own monsters. And so if you want a little bit of uh, hopefully fun homework, it would be to try to create your own monster that and then once you've got it, come up with with the science for it. Why did you choose the choose a, these two animals? Why did you give it the head of an eagle and the bottom of a lion instead of instead of reversing it. Um, so do that, have some fun with it. And that's my present presentation. And now we, uh, we get to, to switch to my favorite part, which is the questions. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was so fascinating. I love seeing the different photos and I guess they're not photos, the different pictures and images from all the different kinds of mythology and different creatures. That's, I love monsters. And I, you know, when uh, I read your book, it didn't occur to me that they were not magical because the, it was such a good adventure, but you're absolutely right. Everything is so realistic feeling in science space. So it's really cool to see and hear you talk about that. So if you have a question for Kelly, you can start typing them in the chat now. Um, and then I'm going to ask them to Kelly. So our first one is from Olivia and she wants to know what is your favorite animal that you've created so far? So in, in your books, in the series, which of the monsters have you created or worked with that you like the most? You know, uh, the ones that are my, I love jackalopes. Jackalopes happen to be one of my favorite. And that's why you get a baby jackalope as Rowan's main companion. I also really like the Keppel Doers. The aquatic uh, horses were a lot of fun to do, uh, to uh, make them scary too. Because yes, in uh, book two, they are scary. And to make a horse that swims my 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 scariest monster was lots of fun 
Yeah, I mean, I bet it was. And I've read the second book, which is scary. Those things are very scary. And I did want to mention to everyone that we're actually going to give away the second book in the series. So that's The Griffin's Lair. So Kelly talked a little bit about it today. So if you are here um, on our chat today, we're going to pick an email address randomly and you can win. But if you don't get it, it's still available in stores right now. And that's the second book in the series. Um, so I have a question here. Um, when did you know you wanted to be a writer? Uh, when did I know? I don't think I ever thought I want to become a novelist. Um, I think if I had always written, so I had been telling stories since before I, I was old enough to write them down. So I always knew that I would want to write stories. I would want to tell stories. To become a you know actual writer as my career seemed too big. It seemed like it would take forever to write one single book and therefore I almost certainly would need a job while I was writing. Uh, so it wasn't until I got older and started writing that I started started uh, saying, you know, I probably could write more than one book every 10 years, which I kind of uh, do uh, now. Uh, so that's when it became maybe I could uh, do this for a job. Amazing. Um, we have some questions about specifically about uh, Royal Guide to Monster Slaying. So we have a question here about uh, why did you choose the name Rowan? And maybe if you want to talk about choosing your names in general, because there's such great names in this book, that might be a fun thing for us to know. Yeah, so uh, yeah, names are always fun. Certainly early in my career, names were chosen very specifically for their meanings. Um, the further I go on though, the fewer names I have to choose from. I mean, I've used so many names. So when it comes to a new book, I will go through lists and lists of names, crossing off any one that I have used. And then you get down to a smaller subset and start looking at that. And you're trying to, if you're going to pick Rowan for the main character, you don't want someone else, a different main character with a, whose name starts with an R or anything that sounds similar. So you want them to, to be different. So you're gonna have Rowan, Dane, Alienor. So Rowan came from, I had asked people for something totally different. I had asked people online to give me names and Rowan happened to be somebody's daughter's name. And I was like, I have never used that. So when it came to this book, I remembered that name and thought, yes, she's perfect for this, for this book. Dane and Alinor and the others come a lot from Old English. I was looking up medieval names and I would sometimes tweak them. We have Reed, um, who would normally be R Y H or R H Y D. Um, and I added an extra D on because it looks nicer. Yeah. So the great thing about fantasy is you can take an actual name and tweak it a bit to uh, what looks uh, good on the, on the, great. On the, yeah. I love that. Um, we have a question here um, about where you get your ideas in general for books. So you've written a lot of books in a lot of different categories. So where are these ideas coming from? They come from everywhere. They really do. I can go specifically into this one because I can't always say where an idea comes from. This one is very specific. And it was that I, I love monsters for uh, one thing. And I happen to be playing a video game that is about a monster hunter. And I kind of thought, you know what, I would love to write a Monster Hunter book sometime. Nothing like the video game character or world, an entirely different, but I love this idea of hunting monsters. So a few, few years passed and I started writing a, a young adult book that was what we now see as this, the basic concept I started writing as young adult and the main character was 17. And it was not working. I would write a few uh, chapters and just something about it wasn't working. So I'd go away, I'd come back, I'd fix a few things, but I couldn't get it to uh, work. And then one day, just out of the blue, I was thinking, I really like that monster hunting story. What's wrong with that? And I went, she's too old. It would work so much better as middle grade with a 12 year old, it'd be more fun. I mean, the one where she was 17 was a lot darker, a lot more serious. And I was like, I could have so much more fun doing it with a 12 year old character. So I rewrote those first few uh, chapters and it worked so much better. Uh, I was just 
lying on it after 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 that. That's a great writing tip too. I know I can tell by the questions we have a lot of aspiring writers and illustrators here, and I think thinking of different ages or you know slightly different genre is a great way to jog your creative juices if you're stuck. Um, so yeah. the question here: Will there be a third book in the series? There is. There's a third book and a fourth book. The third Hooray. book is not. It is called The Serpent's Fury, I that believe. That sounds right to me. That sounds right to me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the Serpent's Fury. Um, so, uh, yes, there is definitely a third and a fourth book done. Third now needs to be edited. Uh, and then it will come out next, uh, probably June, July. Oh, that's very exciting. We're just in time for another summer. More summer of yep. monsters. Yeah. Um, so we had a question here about uh, what the next book that you're writing now. So I don't know if it is that fourth book, but what are you working on right now this very moment as a writer? So what am I, what am I working on right now is a young adult book. I've taken a few years uh, away from a young, young, young adult, and I'm going back into a young adult thriller that I had been working on again. I've been working on it in the past, put it aside because it wasn't quite working, came up with new ideas and dove back into it. It is completely different from uh, this, which is always nice because I can, I can have lots of fun writing Rowan's story and then I can do something that's more serious, a little darker, and then I can go back to the fun stuff. Oh, well, speaking of fun, we've had a few questions here. If you could take any of the creatures from the monster slaying, I guess it's a quartet. Um, if you could bring any of them to life, which one would you choose? Good question. If I could bring any of them to life. I mean, I would be very tempted to say Suniva, the Pegasus, because there's something in me. I mean, as a kid, I was very fond of unicorns. But as you can tell in Royal, Royal Guide, I've made them a bit of jerks. <laughs> because that was kind of fun, was to make unicorns be a bit of jerks. And Suniva, though, is a lot of fun as a, a Pegasus. So I'm going to say that it would be really cool to own my own Pegasus. I mean, having a flying horse these days would be very helpful for a lot of things. <laughs> um, so we have to, I get for some writers here in the room. Can you give us, what are your sort of three top tips for people who would like to write books? And three top tips is one, read, 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 read. Um, I, I meet too many people who say they want to be a writer and they're usually adults and they'll say, I want to write a book. And I'm like, great. What do you read? And they're like, I don't read fiction. And I don't know where you get that from because as a reader, you be Become very, I, you become acquainted with what works for you. I, I still read. I read a lot. And as I read, I'm enjoying it. But I'm also looking at what parts of it do I not enjoy? What parts of it aren't working and why? Um, and that helps me learn for my own writing, you know, what I can do to, to make my own writing better. So you kind of need to be a to be a reading. Um, writing too. If you want to uh, write, write. That doesn't mean you need to write a lot or even write every every day, but don't be afraid to start writing. Don't think that you have to wait until you've learned how to write. You learn how to write by reading and by writing. And then later on, the third step is don't be afraid to get critiques. Once, you, once you've done your reading and your writing, find people that you trust who can look at it and give you advice and be open to that. Be open to saying, how can I make this better? I love my editors. I used to hear when I was, you know, years, 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 years ago, people always said, once you're a big writer, you won't need to be edited. You, you, you can just say no. And I cannot imagine saying no to editing because it makes my books better. So being out there and getting someone else to read it and listening to their advice. That sounds great. Um, now we have a question that's sort of a random question that I think is kind of fun. If you could get stuck in any book in the world, what book would you like to get stuck in? What book would I like to get stuck in? That's a good one. You know, there's lots of historical books I'd love to get stuck in, but I probably wouldn't really like it because I would be like, where's my fridge? Where's my laptop? <laughs> 
<laughs> so those would all be a lot of fun to get us stuck in, but it would definitely have to be a fantasy book. So whether you're going to put me in a world like Harry Potter, um, you know, put put me put me there for a for a while would probably be more comfortable than a medieval world or a Victorian world. Um, and in the same vein, and I actually think this one is going to be a good writing prompt. So if there are writers here listening, this might be something you want to think about. And this could be something you can write after we're done here. If you could be any inanimate object for a day, what would you be and why? <laughs> any inanimate object. I might just want to be a rock so I can just rest. You can rest. That makes there sense. Nothing and nobody expects you to, you to do anything. You can just sleep all day long. I like that. I, I think I would suck in something like that. Um, I think it's great that you mentioned reading and sort of how it can be an interesting thing to help inspire you and help you learn to sort of A, what you like and B, what you don't like. That's a good way of looking at it. Um, who do you, who are you inspired by? So we have a question here about who are some of your favorite authors or who inspires you to write? Yeah, uh, and I'm inspired to write by a lot of the different authors. As as a child, there were certain 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 books that were inspiring me. So you certainly had dating myself, but Hardy Boy books where you, where uh, you had mystery and adventure. Anne of Green Gables is a really obvious choice for the main character. That type of strong but flawed heroine was a lot for me to take in and understand. And I'm, I love seeing that and being able to think that's the type of character, whether she's an orphan on Prince Edward Island or a monster slayer in a fantasy, fantasy world, taking that type of character. So as a kid, I was reading everything I could. And I think, I think I probably took things from a lot of writers. I think that's a good way to learn. You got to practice those styles out. Yeah. Um, so we're going to take two more questions, I think, after this one. So three total, but two more after this. So if you haven't asked your question yet, make sure you put it in the chat right now. Uh, so we have questions about what kind of video games do you like to play? <laughs> <laughs> one of them clearly inspired you. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, for video games, I used to be a programmer. So I've been playing video games since video games were invented. Uh, these days, I play I play first person shooters. I play your know, role playing games. Um, I think that for the last couple of months, I've been playing very quiet games because it seems like with the quarantine, nice quiet games are good. So I've played a lot of Animal Crossing. That's all I can say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people, I think, have done that as well. Yep. Um, oh, here's an interesting question. Do you prefer to write dangerous monsters or the funny, cute monsters? It's probably 50 or 50. I wouldn't want to be writing in a world where every monster was cute and fun. And I wouldn't want to be uh, writing in a world where every monster was dangerous. I mean, it's kind of fun to get that balance. It's kind of like people. If you're going to put like characters into a book, you don't want them all good or all bad. So you've got that mix where some are threats and some are allies, helpers, some are friends, um, and you can sort of work with them. And some can be enemies and become friends. Um, I like that a lot. Again, it sort of speaks to the balance when you're working on a story. Um, okay, let me see our last question here. Do you have a favorite character in A Royal Guide to Monster Slayer? Do I have a favorite? I am very fond of Alianor. Alianor is the friend who is a uh, bandit, bandit, bandit lord's uh, daughter. She is a lot of fun to uh, write because she's not like the other characters. You, I mean, Rowan is a very good person. That is how she was raised to be a good ruler, to always be thinking of other people and thinking of her responsibilities. And she's very good at that. She still has a fun, but she's very good at, at knowing what's the right thing to do. Alianor is not. Alianor is completely knows, you know, she'll be having fun, but she's also the first person in there saying, let's do this thing that we're not supposed to do. And so for her also learning some of Rowan's ethics, while also she helps Rowan to be a little bit more ad adventurous. So they work well together 
as as characters. Yeah, they're a really great, fun pair to read about. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I like that character a lot as well. So that's it for today. So before you leave everyone, I just want to remind you that we will be giving a copy of the second book in the series, The Griffin Slayer, to someone who is here today. Mm -hmm. I can tell some of you have read the book seven, you are in the middle of reading it, and some of you haven't finished it yet. If you have not, the book that is part of Camp Penguin, which you can get at a bookstore near you or wherever you get your children's books, is A Royal Guide to Monster Slaying by Kelly Armstrong, who we just heard from. So I want to say thank you so much, Kelly. I thought your presentation was really interesting. It gave us yeah. lots of food for thoughts. Um, I feel like I want to go in right now and not go back to work. Uh-oh, my colleagues are on this call. They're going to hear me say that. Although I'm at home. Who knows what I'm actually doing? And I want to remind everyone, thanks again for spending your time with us today. We have two more Camp Penguin events tomorrow and Friday. You can sign up for those. You could possibly win a book for those as well. Stay safe, stay inside, and keep reading. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.